All right, you crazy kids, here is your lecture on the periodic table. So there are two important people that I want you guys to know about. Uh, the first one is Dmitry Ivanovich, I think his middle name is, Mendeleev. Uh, he's the father of the periodic table. He has his own element named after him, Mendeleevium. Um, he's the guy that was the first one to come up with an actual table itself. And how he did that is he organized it by mass and properties. Okay, so he put them on note cards. He attempted to organize them looking for a trend or pattern. He noticed when they were organized by mass, certain properties occurred at regular intervals. Or there was a repeating pattern when he organized them by mass. Every so often, a certain element would behave like another element. So he kind of grouped those all together. What he really did is he came up with a periodic table. Now, mind you, it didn't look anything like this, okay? Uh, for one, there was only like 60 elements uh, that were discovered. So he had blanks in his periodic table. So let's pretend like this element isn't here, for example. Um, but kind of a cool thing that he did, right? arranged it. It did not have this shape. You know, if you were to Google Mendeleev's uh, periodic table, you'll notice that it's like a weird squarey type thing. But that's besides the point. He was the first one to kind of do it. A couple of things that he really did that were neat. Notice trillium and iodine here. So trillium and iodine, if we take a look at it, whoa. Trillium has a mass of 127.60, and then iodine is 126.90. Almost everywhere else on the periodic table, the masses always go up, and that's how we organize the periodic table. But he thought it was more important to put iodine with these other elements that had very similar properties. And you guys should remember that all those are diatomics. That's one of many things they have in common, but that's besides the point. Anyway, he thought it was more important to put iodine with these other elements that were very similar in properties than to switch it and put it where pterillium was, and therefore the mass would always increase. So he thought, even though I'm organizing it by mass, I should probably organize it by properties, and properties is more important. Another thing he did is he actually left blanks in his periodic table. So even though this element was not discovered, he put a gap on it and said, like, somebody please discover me, okay? I'm an element. I can predict the properties of you. I know it exists out there. I just can't currently find it. Um, so kind of a neat guy that he, like, let everybody know there's more elements to be discovered because he could see there's a repeating pattern in all the elements in the universe. Well, maybe not the universe, but at least here on Earth. Two unanswered questions. Uh, why could most of the elements be arranged in an increasing atomic mass, but not all of them? For instance, why did he have to switch trillium and iodine? And then what is the reason behind the repeating pattern? So the reason behind the repeating pattern, you guys should already know, that's electron configuration. So the idea that you have certain elements that behave like other elements is because they have a similar electron configuration, or their outer shell electrons, their valence electrons, are very similar to other elements. Kind of neat. Our second guy is called Henry Mosley. He is, a, well, apparently when I wrote this uh, just like five minutes ago, the cool uncle of the periodic table, or father number two, if you will. Um, he did one big important thing to Mendeleev's. So Mendeleev's, once again, he did it by mass. Mosley said, you know what? Atomic numbers are way better to do that, way to do that. Um, so they were able to actually figure out how positive the center of each atom was, or i.e. how many protons it had, and they noticed that elements would always increase by one proton. So he organized it by atomic number, number of protons, rather than mass. He still noticed that the properties appeared at regular intervals, so it still had a repeating pattern, and when it's done by atomic number, notice my atomic number between trillium and iodine still goes up by one, so it still holds true in that pattern, which is really nice. He came up with a periodic law, all right? This is a definition that you should be familiar with, but you don't have to memorize. Uh, when elements are arranged in increasing atomic, uh, atomic number, there is a repeating pattern of their physical and chemical properties. So kind of cool, you can predict the chemical properties based solely on its location on the periodic table, which we're gonna do this unit. And then we have a definition of the periodic table, an arrangement of the elements in order of their atomic number so that elements with similar properties fall into the same column or group. You guys are gonna have a hard time with this, but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, these are called groups, all right? All of these arrows. So vertical things are groups. They're also called families. We really don't refer to them as columns ever, all right? And then going horizontally, these are called periods. Um, a way you can remember this is at Bedford High School, and you'll argue with me, but there are seven periods. Not per day, but total. So here on the periodic table, we have seven periods as well. These are going across. 
All right, so periods go across, and groups or families are vertical. So these are the noble gases in group 18. We've already covered that. Covered that. They all have similar properties because they have similar electron configurations. All right, let's keep on going here. Uh, metals, non-metals, metalloids, and noble gases. So noble gases, we just did that one. Looks like I wanted to mention it again. That's why the note is there. But group 18, or family 18, these are your noble gases. You guys should be very familiar with those. We have a very thick line drawn on the periodic table, and this actually separates it to metals on this side and non-metals on this side, which is pretty cool. Hydrogen is a non-metal. Technically speaking, it should belong over there. But hydrogen has a lot in common with the other elements in this family, so it's actually located where it is for a good reason. But just be aware, hydrogen is the exception to this like dark black band here. Um, it is definitely a non-metal. For metalloids, there's a pattern of metalloids as well. I'm gonna highlight them, we'll go a little bit thinner. We go like one, one, and then we split across and go two, two. And then there's some argument whether or not uh, polonium or acetine or metalloids, don't worry about it, but just leave it for now. But uh, these would be your metalloids. I am going to ask you to identify metalloids in the future or metals and non-metals, so please do that. A great resource that will highlight all of these for you is ptable.com. Go there, check it out. It's pretty cool. Uh, I should probably give you guys a couple of properties of metals and non-metals and metalloids. So metals, you might know, they have like luster. Uh, let's see, they are good conductors. Um, they're generally dense. They're generally hard. Uh, I think that's pretty good for metals. Non-metals would be the opposite, right? They're dull, they're poor conductors, uh, they're generally soft. And metalloids, given their location, they're like halfway between, okay? So sometimes they act like a metal and sometimes they act like a non-metal. Metalloids are stuck right between the transition between what we call a metal and what we call a non-metal. And we're gonna define those a little bit further later on and you'll realize that metals are things that tend to lose electrons because they're not really holding onto the electron, electrons as tightly as your non-metals. And your non-metals are more likely to gain electrons because they're really holding onto the electrons. Uh, but we'll talk about trends in a little bit. All right. Dot notation is something that we also have to add to our electron configuration bag of tricks. Basically, a dot is placed around the symbol of the element representing the valence electrons. Now, what are valence electrons? We're going to be talking about those a lot. They're outer shell electrons that can be lost, can be, be, cross out that too, can be lost, shared, or gained in chemical reactions. We're only going to be dealing with the main group elements when we talk about valence electrons. Your transition elements, which are these guys right here, D block, and that'll be next lecture, we're not going to really worry about their valence electrons. They, they can have one, they can have two, it, it's kind of confusing. So don't worry about valence electrons for D block or for F block. We're not going to get into it. S and P block, S block here and P block here, we refer to these as the main group elements. And it's very easy to count how many valence electrons there you have because you simply count to eight. Everything in group one has one valence electron. Group two, two valence electrons. Hopefully you see the pattern here. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons. All right, that's how that works. You simply count from left to right on the periodic table and then it'll identify your valence electrons. Now, dot notation, we're gonna add this to our bag of tricks for electron configuration. If you recall, we had orbital, we had exponential, we had noble gas. Dot notation is only the valence electrons. We don't have to worry about anything else. And you place a dot in a specific location to tell me you know it has one valence electron. We're gonna be using this a lot, so don't feel like this is gonna go away. If I were to look at potassium with its one valence electron, I'm gonna put a dot on top of potassium. We're gonna pretend that you're gonna have a total of eight different possible locations. And here are the locations with our made up element Q. Notice how there's like two per side, and it kind of forms this like square around the actual element. That's where the dots are gonna go. There is a very specific location for each individual dot. I'm not gonna be that crazy, but the process that we're gonna follow is as following. Your first dot is gonna go up here. Your second dot is gonna go here. Then you're gonna go one dot per side before doubling up. 
because these represent s, and this would be like px, this would be like py, and this would be like pz. Interesting, that's actually what's happening there. This is p block, right? So these dots are these dots, and this is s block. So those dots, or those electrons, are those dots. That's how it works. That's why I need you to follow that kind of pattern. For magnesium, it's located here. It would be S2, so I need to show two dots up on top. You might ask, well, if I put one of those dots over here, come on, circle it. Why isn't this letting me grab it? Grab that dot. It won't let me grab it. Well, I'll just have to erase it. If I put that dot over here, am I going to get credit? No! If I put two dots over here, and they're still together, do I get credit? No! Your first two dots, because they're in S block, go up top. That's where they belong. For elements over here, you go one per side before you double up. Same as electron configuration. So let's do all the way across. Aluminum, we would have one, two, three. Silicon, let's do a different color. We would have one, two, three, four. Uh, phosphorus, one, two, three, four, five. There's the five. Let's go with sulfur, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we'll have to go back to pink, I guess. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then finally, we'll have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Notice how there's always been like pairs here. I'm not just randomly doing them. I can see that this is a group, this is a group, this is a group, and then there's one open location right there. That's gonna be very important when we talk about bonding. If you just randomly throw these electrons on there, I'm not gonna give you credit. For instance, if you put chlorine seven like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that doesn't look like together dots to me, okay? I can see a pair here. Like I can see a pair here and a pair here. Here, it's like, what is this a pair? I don't even know. So be careful of where you actually put your dots. I think that's it. Woo, we're done.